Aloha. It's June the 16th, 2022. It's Thursday, it's 11 o'clock. That could mean only one thing. Time for American Issues, take two. Uh, today, our title is The Senate Agrees on Gun Safety Reform, uh, long and coming. Uh, I would like to introduce our co-host, special guest, uh, Stephanie Dalton. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi. Good Aloha. morning. Uh, did you ever think this moment would come where you had 10 Republicans and 10 Democrats getting together and they actually hammered out a informal agreement about some uh, gun safety reform. I'll, I'll try not to use the word gun control because uh, semantically gun control means you're trying to control. And we all know that the GOP doesn't like that word control because they just don't think they wanna be controlled, particularly when it comes to the second amendment and, and, and uh, assault rifles. So we won't call it gun control, we'll call it gun safety. That'll make them feel better. Well, I, I, for me, uh, I want to thank uh, Senator Cornyn, who um, has jumped into this project, along with uh, Senator Kuhn and the and the other all the others that are participating in it. Because, as you know, it's since 1993 since we've had any legislation developed or, or passed or put into law, and it's so long overdue, making whatever they come up with a major advance. And that's really pitiful to have to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, accept that, but that's where we are. And we have to learn, you know, how to develop our commonalities, common understandings and where we can agree. So, but thank, th and so for once I can thank hardly a Republican Senator from Texas. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. And I hope he keeps it up. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about what kind of in principle the two groups have come up with as far as um, what they're gonna to try to craft language into a bill, what that might look like. Uh, one key component is called the red flag provision, which is to say, um, if someone's having some issues, most of these mass shooters actually advertise what they're gonna do before they do it, or they discuss you know, that they're having severe mental issues and they, they um, kind of weave that into their gun ownership. Uh, so this red flag law just gives the opportunity for family and friends to contact the authorities and say, hey, there might be an issue here. Would you go talk to this individual? Uh, right now, that is a key component of this, and it's, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Another one is, and I don't really care for the way it's being, the moniker of this one is called the boyfriend provision, which is to say if there's a history of domestic violence, uh, that this individual who's applying for a gun uh, would probably be prohibited from for purchasing a gun because they have a history of domestic violence. Uh, there is a back background check for uh, people that are under 21 years of age. Uh, there is a whole bunch of money for school fortification. I I'm not sure I agree with that, but uh, a lot of money for schools and teachers to pack weapons if they want and probably door gun, you know, door safety and. Uh, you know, uh, uh, security officers uh, signed to each school. There's money, um, incentive money for those states that want to implement a red flag law. And there's money for mental health counseling, uh, things of that nature. So that's what's kind of in the, the roundhouse. Stephanie, what do you think's missing? What's obviously missing? Um, well, what's missing, there's some plenty good good protections in what they're thinking about putting into legal language. Um, well, what's missing is a very long list, but I think the, the upfront missing one, the, the big disappointing missing one, I think, is uh, getting the age raised from 18 to 21 for ownership. Um, mm -hmm. I just think that uh, a case has been made for the, the, the teenager, uh, and that, that's a, what an 18 year old is and a 19 year old, and they're just not steady enough uh, or settled in their growth and hormonal <laughs> systems development to, to, to be uh, in, to, to, to get away from impulsive kinds of, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm thinking X. So I. Okay, we might have some other problems here, technical difficulties. Um, I'll take over what's missing in the bill, and I think. A big part of it, which the House Democrats have passed, is an assault weapons ban. Uh, the fact that 
people are allowed to carry an AR-15 and carry it about, not even have to do a background check in some states to get an AR-15. And that's a multi-rapid fire weapon. It's, it's an assault weapon. It was meant for military uh, usage, certainly not for hunting. And uh, other than target practicing, um, it's, you know, it's one of those weapons that is often used in these mass shootings. Another provision, which I don't see here in, the, in this discussion, are the, um, the extended ammo clips. I don't see that, that component being addressed. Uh, it's one thing to have a, a, a Glock 17 that holds 14 rounds, and quite another to get a 30 round clip um, to use in your Glock 17, or an extended clip in your AR-15. So uh, extended ammo clips, I don't really see as part of the discussion here. And those are the two main things I think that most Democrats would like to see, and it's just not even up for discussion. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the concept is, hey, we got to start somewhere. Are you with me well, again, just, Stephanie? Can you hear me? Thank you. I'm here. I just wanted to reinforce my point uh, when I realized that even to go rent a car, but, uh, and CAR is, is a very good model for how to handle guns, since it's a, a very dangerous piece of equipment as well. But to rent a car, you can't even get one until you're 25. So people who are in business on cars uh, and vehicles, you know, they're not wasting any time on having people they can't depend on being careful in their driving habits and following the law. So I think that that's another uh, argument in it. I don't know that we're talking so much about the points of the debate, but there yeah. was. Well, while you were having some technical difficulties, I mentioned two brief points. One is what we don't have in this discussion, we won't see it for years to come, is an assault ban, a, a, a assault weapon ban, a complete ban on assault weapons. And uh, the other part was uh, extended ammo clips for those assault weapons. And we have lost Stephanie again. All right. Well, I might just be doing a solo show here today, but we'll get it back. Uh, so, uh, so one of the, of them. are you with me? Hello, Stephanie. Okay, so uh, she's going in and out. Uh, one of the things that also I think is a key component of the discussion in the Senate is uh, looking at domestic violence and those who are uh, desirous to have a weapon, even be it AR-15 or even if it's a, a five-shot Smith & Wesson detective special, uh, if you have a background of domestic violence, should you be allowed to obtain a weapon legally? And the answer, I think, is a good one that they're discussing is no, no weapons for you. Uh, background checks. Again, Stephanie, you were talking about that. Go ahead. Background checks for anyone who's under 21. That's part of the part of the discussion in the Senate. Well, I think, you know, we need to raise it a little higher because what what is the point? And by that, I mean more principled, higher principles. Um, what is it that they're getting the guns for? I mean, so th there's some other questions that could be asked here. I mean, for instance, um, with the uh, AR-15 and the other assault weapons, um, tanks i don't know about those but an a, a person with these long rifles you know is asking to be able to carry those out in the streets too and uh, people are questioning that but as far as uh, the hunting excuse cover or purpose the hunting um the respected the the self-respected hunter is not going to take an ar-15 no they, they won't go to the hunting but a but lot of for kids. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people like to go target shooting. Uh, that's what they like to do. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's very expensive because if one round, one round of ammo for some of these weapons is almost a dollar. So it's extremely expensive to do these days. Uh, but it's, you know, the other argument, and then I could I could see where they're coming from is that when someone's breaking your door down, um, by the time the police get there, the, the crime has been committed. The time is to defend yourself and the weapons you need to do so now in the society where everyone has an automated, automated we weapon and a uh, rapid fire weapon is, you know, trying to match match for like and trying to match AR-15 for AR-15. I don't know if that's really the case, certainly not here in Hawaii, but I could, I could say that the castle doctrine is, is well in place and, and the need for you to have a weapon in your home to protect yourself or your family or friends is paramount. 
But uh, to take it out in the streets, I, I see no value in that whatsoever, zero. Well, from what I've read, the data does not show that it helps or that the weapon in the home is used often successfully to protect one's property or oneself. The data does not support having a weapon in the home to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. So that deserves some further look if anybody wants to discuss it more. Uh, just what are those data points? I mean, I'm sure anyone who's not practiced and been to, you know, the shooting gallery is not going to be real good with the gun, no matter that they have it. So, I mean, I, there are a number of issues there, but I think that we need to look at the data on some of mm -hmm. these questions to see what does that tell us? And by that same token, we will get that when we see Canada go without these weapons and we'll break there, have a, a, a natural experiment. Uh, we can well, let me ask you a question about, I think one of the most important provisions is that red flag, red flag law provision. And that's to say, if someone's having some issues um, that may be mentally unstable or emotionally distraught, that there's an opportunity to, you know, contact somebody and say something. If you see something, say something. And it's exactly that. A lot of states now are starting to wonder whether they want to have that provision. And I think it's, it's the key component of, of this discussion in the Senate. And so what do you think, how do you feel about the fact that if some of these states I'm thinking of Texas or Georgia, or some of the southern states where we have a lot of mass shootings. Uh, what if these states say, no, we're not interested in that? Uh, is, this, is this discussion, is this proposed bill going to be worth anything? Well, you know, that's a, it's such a good question, Tim. And I know that uh, it, just looking at it, first of all, from a personal standpoint, most of us um, are, don't take lightly hearing from someone, whether a police officer or counselor, that our, our youngster or our relative or loved one is a problem. So I think we get into some diagnostic uh, challenges here and certainly some uh, who's gonna enforce this thing. And, and uh, I, I just see there's so many trips and wires to getting uh, that to work really, really well. There's, well there's, uh, there's 19 states that have it and Hawaii certainly is one of them. We have a red flag law. Uh, the way I, I read it is if you're a family member, you have the right to uh, raise the alarm. But that leaves out the whole bunch of people like coworkers or, you know, people in the community that they know a certain individual and have a lot more exposure on a more frequent basis with that individual than maybe a family member does. And so even in Hawaii, those individuals are um, barred from raising a concern. So on a national level, I would like to see a national bill that opens up that door to allow more people to say, I think we have a problem here, Houston. Well, who's going to take that problem on that's where i see that that's the so you you mr smith come and report that and then me uh, mrs jones with that uh, you know aiming at my kid or husband or boyfriend mm -hmm. um, how is you know, how it, are we gonna make that work uh, i think you know, you're implying happen. maybe you're not implying but i'm starting to read it that way but that sure. this could be used as a retaliatory tool against an individual kind of like a tro a temporary restraining order. Sometimes it's used as a temp, you know, as a, a retaliation tool. And um, as we all know, a TRO has to be has to go in front of a judge. And I think, I think the concept of that there will be some kind of due process before uh, someone's approached about confiscation of their weapon. So I would have to think it there'd have to be due process. But the problem is it has to be acted upon immediately and not linger out in the court system for weeks and months. Um, well, the time is now. Yeah, the point you get to the pitfall, you know, right there at the end, because that due process um, is going to take time. And the diagnostics and the testing and the evaluation approaches we have for mental health um, aren't perfect. Uh, and so that that that's very difficult diagnosis process to go through. It's certainly yeah. difficult in terms of the time that it's going to take to get to some uh, agreement. And then probably it needs to be consensual. So, so yeah, you bring it up. I think that that's my, my concern about um, relying on that. I definitely would like it after. I, I'm, I'm pleased to know that they're going to fund it and we're going to get more resources for that. That's good. Let's go. Cause that'll make the, the, the tools and the instruments and the professionals better at what they do, which will take mm -hmm. time. And maybe we can get it more clearly you know, do you know, um, what do you say? Um, defined and yeah. uh, act faster, your point. Yeah, you know, you're, you're an educator. Um, how do you feel about more money for the schools? I mean, 
this is issue came up many years ago. I remember doing an interview, a man on the street interview about how, as a teacher, how do you feel about uh, the opportunity <laughs> to, to pack heat? <laughs> how do you feel about that? Or how do you feel about fortifying each and every elementary school or junior high or high school into some kind of war wagon fortress? Well, I guess I can take it from your, your tone there that um, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Not I too mean, subtle, is all, it? <laughs> why is it the fire department speaking up here? I mean, how many times have all of us had the experience of the fire department? Oh, by the way, you can't put that in front of the, you know, I mean, there are all of these fire rules that nobody's mentioning that would prohibit the kind of fortification that would have to be used to really be protective. And, uh, and then you've got the problem of getting everybody in and getting everybody out in a timely manner. So I, I do think there's an absent voice that's the fire. I think Stephanie was saying that there's some provisions that are worthwhile, uh, but the issues of fire safety will prevent some of the uh, fortification of schools. Um, we're gonna go on to the next topic. And the next topic, of course, is the January 6th hearings. And today is the third day where we are hearing testimony, specifically most of this testimony is centering around Mike Pence and his, um, his involvement and the pressure that he received to basically disrupt the peaceful transition from one president, number 45, to number 46. And the uh, testimony that Mike Pence is, you know, that we're hearing is that he basically was running the country while Donald Trump was sitting in the, um, the dining room watching the insurrection unfold. And to uh, General Milley's point that um, uh, Mark Meadows, who's the chief of staff said, hey, we gotta change the narrative. We can't let people think that Mike Mike Pence, the Vice President of the United States, was running the show on January 6th. We gotta, we gotta change that narrative. Well, in fact, you can't change the narrative because Mike Pence was running the show. Mike Pence was the one who was responsible to get um, more assistance, more military support, more security support to the Capitol because it was overrun. And uh, had it not been for Mike Pence uh, on the phone doing that, um, things may well change out differently. Uh, the testimony today shows that um, those who invaded the Capitol were not more than 40 feet away from Vice President Mike Pence. Uh, I remember well that the Capitol Police, I forget his name, um, he basically lured them in the opposite direction and they followed him. But had they gone in the other direction, Mike Pence was in the room 40 feet away and that would have been a completely different story. So. Um, I think we've lost Stephanie. I'm not sure if she's, she's not here. So I'll continue as to what I think are the salient points of what we've experienced in the uh, three hearings on, that we've been listening to. And I think the one that, that captivates my attention is the blatant, repeated statements from Trump's staff that no, Mr. President, you cannot have the vice president uh, overturn the count of the electoral votes. You cannot do that. Also, the, the, the constant plea is that, Mr. President, there was no fraud in the vote counts in Arizona. There were no fraud counts in the uh, city of Philadelphia. There were no fraud counts in Georgia. And Donald Trump's repeated insistence to say, oh, yes, there was. And rather than listening to his uh, safe and sane team, they called Team Normal, Donald Trump decided on his own to listen to drunk Rudy, Rudy Giuliani, uh, intoxicated on, on election night. He decided to listen specifically to Rudy Giuliani. And he went out at one in the morning, two in the morning to say, I have won this election. Stop the count. It's over. I'm now uh, uh, second term president. Well, he was advised not to do that, but he did it anyway. So the question is, if Donald Trump willingly and knowingly ignored that, created a false narrative, created what we call the big lie, and then that big lie gathered momentum and then resulted into 
an invasion of our capital and certainly led to the deaths of a number of individuals that day on January 6th and the day after. Uh, to what degree is there culpability? What degree was uh, Donald Trump well-informed, had the conscience of mind to ignore multiple messages that there was no stolen election, that he had not won the election, that the vice president, Mike Pence, did not have the authority to overturn the count? Uh, to what degree is he culpable in all that? And I suppose that's not the job of, of the House Select Committee to decide, but certainly the Department of Justice and specifically Merrick Garland. Hi, Stephanie, glad to see you back. So apologize to you and the viewers. Oh, that's here. okay. You know, I can pontificate for many things and, and for a long time. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming back. Hey, we're just talking about uh, the January 6th Select Committee. And, you know, the, the two, two more main points I've got now the hearing is uh, all the the, the, the advice from his, his counsel, from his staff saying, hey, no, no big lie here, no stone election. And two, Mike Pence doesn't have the authority to do this, yet Donald Trump did it anyway. And so the testimony today really went into a lot of detail, and there'll be more, about Mike Pence and his act and his role in basically uh, a coup of the a free and fair election of the United States. Your thoughts mm -hmm. about the hearing that either in the last three days uh, that's transpired. I did want to uh, say, um, wrapping up on the gun issue, I know we're not wrapped up on it, but if we're going to be inter interstitial on this, we um, Matthew McConaughey is now getting involved with the Uvalde shooting uh, school, school shooting. And he, I wanted to mention him because he, he is addressing raising the age and some of the, those those items that were left out as you asked that question what was left out well here's somebody powerful and with some influence that might help move that uh, uh, needle a little bit tim so i just wanted to make sure we included yeah. that a good um, point you know he was raised in uvalde yeah and so another texan so he does have some um, skin in the game and credibility on that point yeah definitely and so the the the, the six the january 6 committee is ab absolutely riveting and astoundingly upsetting um, that we came so close. I think anybody that watches it gets a real chill thinking that, you know, we could be back in Dodge City. I mean, is that where we want to go? I mean, here's the, the violence. I mean, all they want to do is solve the problems by violence and in any means necessary, like um, like a mob boss. And that's that's the Trump approach. Anything that will work to get him in the position he wants to be. And well, that's what, let me ask you this. What about the comment well you know what that's just donald being donald haven't we given him a pass for five years of donald being donald and gee whiz he really didn't mean it or he was just kidding uh haven't we had enough of that haven't we seen enough evidence in the last three hearing meetings to say wow he really calculated along with eastman his attorney uh really calculated a coup d'etat uh they certainly when does did. when does giving donald trump a pass stop well, it's the base. I think uh, we have to realize that there's, uh, you know, a lot of people in the United States who are of that of that uh, way of thinking about matters. Something, um, and and I think that that has kept him. And that, that of course, he takes care of his base. And there, that's remember, that's the first time they've been given power like this, and they've gotten power and more power to keep um, these things in play and that we haven't been able to uh, address them because of concern about that base. And so we can see it playing out in the mm -hmm. election going on now. And yes, we have done enough of this, but the point is who, who is America? America is these people and it's other people who have a different way of thinking about it that is demonstrated in these hearings about the, the tremendous way you go about solving our problems and setting up our democracy and our government. I mean, I like to, I like the historical references and these people were also talking about Jefferson and Adams and talking about uh, even as vice presidents, they didn't pull this stuff, we, you know, in the early days of the constitution. So showing what it takes to get a system in place like our democracy, I think is a good thing and definitely a lesson for all of us about America's democracy. And yet, um, you know, we we have an appreciation for it, even if we don't know all the 
details like we're learning from this presentation, but hopefully the rest of the people that are in this other group who just want to solve it by violence might learn that, you know, we, we did that for thousands of years with kings and lords and tribes that then America came mm -hmm. along and we decided to do it in other ways. They let, let's take credit for it yeah. and try and get with it. You know, I, I think a lesson that comes out of this is, is two things. One is, you know, if you're working for the president of the United States, that's quite an honor. Um, you know, as if I were an American and the president of the United States said, I want you to be on my administration, it's an honor uh, to serve my country in that capacity. But, you know, all the testimony specifically like Bill Barr, you know, they're trying to re resurrect the their reputation of saying, well, I really was instrumental in uh, trying to tell the president he couldn't do what he wanted to do. But during the process after or during bef or before, they were mum, they were silent, they were mute. And I, I, I can't help but think that there's the importance of someone following their oath to the office versus their allegiance and loyalty to an individual, in this case, Donald Trump. And I think if there's any lessons to that is um, an awareness that if you, if you do take the oath of office, I don't care if you're a, you know, a police officer or whatever, uh, or a congressman or a, a state legislator, you, you owe the office the oath to the constitution and the principle of democracy to preserve the republic. And I, I think that was missing uh, all this time in, in Trump's administration. He picked loyal, lovable lackeys. Well, not so lovable. Well, you know, many of them um, were, were, were really, um, well, are, are shocking that, that they, they stayed loyal to him and didn't say anything, even those who have helped move this, this um, discovery process along. But I think people thought because this base has been brought out, opened the, the Gorgon's cage, right? So all mm -hmm. of these people came out and I don't mean to demean them because they are who they are and they do what they do. But now I think everybody was so comfortable with having that base and having it be almost equal to the rest of the country that I think they feel have a different way of looking at things and that they want to have a disparate um, point, uh, way to do things, which involves violence. And uh, somehow we're going to have to come together. But I, I, you bring up the most important, these people are just as, as Ch Liz Ch Okay. I think that will, <laughs> that will basically be end of the said, program. You know, oh, what? you're back. Okay. I'm so sorry, Tim. I, but not, to, this, not to worry. You know, let's do this. Good. We're, we're, we've, run out of time on the program. So let's get your last thoughts on either the gun safety uh, matter in the Senate or on January 6 hearings and whatever point you would like to, you know, really leave us uh, an impression with. Well, thank you for the chance to say something. Um, and I'll be brief. I'm um, very. All righty. I'm going to assume that will be the last phrase for today. Um, I'd like to say Stephanie Dalton for joining us today. Um, I hope she can hear me um, sign off with thanking her for appearing on this show. Uh, she leaves me with a memory or a vision of the about. Gorgon case. Oh, you're back. Okay. <laughs> it's been tough. <laughs> Go ahead, Stephanie. Something sign is definitely Sign off as best you can, and we're going to wrap it up. Gotta be the motive. But the, yeah, and so your patient. Aloha. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm Tim Apatillo, the host, filling in for Jay Fidel for American Issues, take two. Won't you please join us next Thursday at 11 o'clock? And until then, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com.
Mahalo.